Hello and welcome everyone. We we online and today I'm going to start a new movie What if Naruto became the White Fox and destroyed Hidden Leaf Village Part 1. If you enjoy this video please give it a big thumbs up and to watch more videos like this subscribe to my channel and turn that bell notification on so you never miss an upload. Now wasting no more time, let's begin. Naruto had recently survived the battle of his life, a fight with his best friend, Sasuke Achiha. The two had fought so hard to win in the Valley of the End that it was a miracle they didn't kill each other. Even Kakashi was taken aback when he arrived too late. He couldn't find Sasuke, but he did come across an unconscious Naruto who was bleeding from an open wound on his chest. At first, Kakashi was perplexed. Why would Sasuke try to kill Naruto with that jutsu? Despite everything those two had been through, the ups and downs, and even the arguments, Kakashi was certain they were brothers in arms no matter what. The copy ninja carrying Naruto's bleeding body told him otherwise. Kakashi was dispatched to retrieve Sasuke, but he arrived too late. If he knew anything for certain, it was that the council would find a way to punish Naruto for all of this. As soon as the silver-haired man arrived at Konoha's gates, he dashed to the hospital to have Naruto treated. Not surprisingly, the majority of the retrieval team had also been sent to the hospital. When Kakashi entered the emergency room, Shikamaru was sitting on a chair outside. When he saw the blood trail, his heart sank at the thought of how he nearly killed his entire team. Kakashi rushed Naruto to the emergency room before heading out to inform Tsunade. He was afraid of what she would think of all of this. The mission failed, Sasuke was exposed as a traitor, and everyone except Shikamaru was nearly killed. She was going to have a ball with this. Naruto was being operated on as Kakashi was on his way to see Lady Hakage. He replayed everything in his head over and over again. Sasuke had tried to kill him several times and had come dangerously close a few times. If the open wound, nearly a fist-sized hole in his chest, revealed Sasuke's motivation, Naruto couldn't believe how far his teammate had sunk in his pursuit of power and vengeance. The blonde was sickened by how much praise Sasuke received only to throw it back in everyone's face. How could he do this to a village that has gone out of its way to help him? He just threw it all away for some sort of revenge scheme. Throwing everything away for vengeance, in Naruto's opinion, was a very foolish mindset. Hello, Kit. That deep voice echoed in his ears once more. This time, it sounded a little less sinister. It's almost soothing. Kit, open your eyes. Naruto did as he was told and strainedly opened his eyes. When he fully opened them and focused, he discovered himself in some sort of sewer with a large gate in front of him. The blonde was wide-eyed not because of the surroundings or the gate. It was what was inside that gate, not what was outside. A massive red fox. The fox with nine tails. Naruto jumped to his feet, only to discover that the floor was mostly water. He looked at the fox with fear on his face, but that stopped when he noticed the fox's eyes. It wasn't the look of a demon seeking destruction and death, but rather of a being concerned about someone. You can unwind, Kit. The fox began in a standard tone. You know what, Kit, if I hadn't jumped in right away, you would have died. Are you aware of this? When Naruto heard the fox's words, he relaxed. It was correct. He'd be dead from that chidori through his chest if it hadn't intervened. So, Naruto began with a puzzled expression. How come you saved me? The fox still had a sad expression on its face as it pondered the answer to that question. True, if Naruto died, the fox would perish, but there was more to it than that. A deeper bond, if you will, that it has never felt with any of its other vessels. A sadness that could be felt by both of them, as well as a glimmer of hope. It linked the two in a way that even it didn't understand. The fox sighed and turned away from Naruto, lowering its head. The blonde didn't know why, but he could feel the fox spirit's sorrow. Well, whatever the case may be, Naruto began, making the fox wince, fearful that its jailer would do what the others would do. I appreciate it. The nine-tailed fox blinked open its eyes and looked at Naruto, surprised that the boy thanked it. Naruto felt himself waking up from wherever he was before it could say anything. He faded away from the fox, leaving it to ponder what kind of vessel Naruto was and how he differed from the others. A week after the mission, in a hospital room, Naruto awoke from his slumber and slowly opened his eyes. He groaned as he was met by sunlight streaming into his room. He quickly covered his eyes with his right hand and noticed how heavily taped his arm was. The medical tape wrapped around his palm and wrist and up to his elbow. He sat up in his bed, winced slightly at his still bruised body. Naruto could see from a closer inspection of his body that the majority of his body was bandaged up from the Chidori, and the scratches and cuts from his battle with Sasuke. Naruto had to express his gratitude to the fox for its healing abilities. Naruto would not have gotten even halfway to Konoha if it hadn't been for that. Naruto was fine, aside from the wounds and bandages from using a very powerful and dangerous racing gun. 
He looked around the room for any sign of a doctor or any of his friends. He was surprised to find no one watching him. This brought back memories of being sent to the hospital by an Anbu as a child. When he awoke, no one was there to check on him or ask if he was okay in any way. It felt vaguely familiar now. Naruto decided to get out of bed and move around a little to stretch his stiff muscles. Who knows how long he was gone. Before going to the window to see the village, he moved his arms and legs a little to get some feeling back into them. In Konoha, it was another bright and sunny day. People went about their daily activities as if nothing had happened. Naruto was relieved to see that no one was complaining about their beloved Sasuke being a traitor. With Naruto's knowledge of how the villagers behave, the blame was almost certainly going to be placed on him in some way. As Naruto leaned against the window, he didn't hear the door open and a masked Anbu enter. The Anbu was a woman wearing a Nico mask and having her purple hair tied up at the time. She noticed Naruto standing up and tensed up. She was well aware of her responsibilities and dreaded every aspect of them. The Anbu spoke after taking a deep breath. Izumaki Naruto. Naruto turned to see her standing in the doorway, startled by her unexpected appearance in his room. Your presence in the council meeting is required as soon as you are able. The Anbu was gone in a shunshin before Naruto could even say okay. That alone was a red flag. Naruto decided to shrug it off and prepare to be yelled at by this council once more. He didn't despise the council, rather, he despised the fact that they blamed him for so many problems in the village. When Naruto was kicked out of the orphanage, a few of them participated in a previously annual fox hunt. Those were dark days that Naruto was glad were behind him. It took some time, but Naruto was finally able to leave the hospital and change into some of his more comfortable clothes. His jacket from when he arrived was now shredded, so he just tied it around his waist while wearing his regular clothes and a headband around his neck to conceal some bandages. As Naruto walked out of the hospital and into the fresh air, he couldn't help but notice that more than a few eyes were on him. It wasn't unusual for the blonde, but he hadn't felt like people were staring at him with hatred in a long time. With the way he saw people looking at him as he walked down to Hakage Tower, he felt like a child again. Naruto decided to shrug it off and continued on his way to finish this and get some ramen later. He'd have to talk to his friends and sensei later unless he ran into them. I still can't believe that demon brat let Sasuke go. As Naruto passed them, one person whispered to another. I know. If anything, I wish the Uchiha could have killed that monster and rid us of it all. Another person whispered. When I found out he was still alive and had lost the Uchiha, I just wanted to smother the little demon. Another hushed voice. He's now in pain. So why don't we just kill him? Because that old scumbag of a Hakage would have us executed. HMPH. Seeing that demon walking around, knowing he's the reason Sasuke is no longer with us, makes me so angry. The whispers were becoming a little too loud for Naruto to hear clearly. He should perish. It's entirely his fault. The demon should simply vanish. Someone like him should not exist in our community. Perhaps we should have another fox hunt this year. When Naruto heard the various comments he hadn't heard in nearly a year, his happy mood turned to depression. He had long suspected that the villagers were beginning to regard him as a ninja and respect him. But with this one act, that was no longer the case. Naruto didn't want to hear anything else and ran away to finish the meeting and go home to rest. Meeting of the council. Tsunade had just learned of Naruto's recovery and impending arrival at the meeting. She went wide-eyed and despised what she was forced to do. If she knew Naruto, she knew he'd be devastated by what was about to happen to him. When she looked around the Shinobi Council, she saw a mix of rage and sadness. It was understandable given that the majority of their children had long been friends with the Jinjiriki. The look on the boy's face when he was told this will stay with them for a long time. She then turned to face the civilian council and was astounded by their smirks and satisfied glares. Tsunade was sickened that these people were the main reason Naruto's life was such a living hell when he was just a scared child. Many of those council members would suffer at Tsunade's hands if she got her way. Her rage was shattered, however, when Naruto walked through the door. She turned to face the boy and blanched at his presence. Naruto saw this as yet another red flag. Tsunade never paled in comparison to anything, unless it was bad news. Naruto waited in front of the council to hear what they intended to do about the failed Uchiha recovery mission. Naruto Uzumaki Genin Tsunade began after a few minutes of waiting. Naruto said nothing and just stared at her with his bright blue eyes. I'm truly sorry, Naruto. She paused before proceeding. As a result of your failure to retrieve Sasuke Acha and nearly killing your team, you are hereby she paused for a few moments before taking a deep breath and continuing. Expelled from Kanohagakure, Naruto's eyes widened and his jaw dropped to the floor. 
he couldn't find the words to express how he felt about this. Anger, betrayal, hatred, sadness, denial. He had no idea. Tsunade despised having to say those dreaded words, and the Shinobi Council despised hearing them. As he processed everything, he turned to the civilian council and saw their satisfied and disgusted expressions. You have until 10 a.m. tomorrow to pack your belongings and leave the village or face force, Tsunade said as she averted her gaze from his sad eyes. His eyes would haunt her dreams for the rest of her life. Naruto was still unable to speak. He simply couldn't. There were no words to describe how he felt. The emptiness he had long assumed was filled was now empty once more. Naruto walked slowly back towards the door, holding back tears as he exited the room. Tsunade wanted to go console him, but was stopped by one of the elders who was bandaging his face. She could only watch as Naruto's entire world crumbled around him for the sake of one traitorous brat. Naruto waddled back to his rat hole of a home, his mind still unable to process everything that had happened. What happened just now? He reflected to himself. First, the villagers turned on him again, and now he's been expelled for failing to bring back a traitor. He had been devoted to this village his entire life. He stayed in the hopes of one day becoming Hakage and earning the respect of everyone. He was always loyal, no matter how hard the beatings, near-death experiences, tortures, or other harsh treatment he received from these people. Then, after one failed mission to bring back this village's prized loyal Achiha, he was exiled. That made absolutely no sense to him. He could still hear the villagers bashing him as he walked on, his face stiff and shocked. One word kept coming up among the various insults and hurtful remarks directed at him. Demon. That word had been said to him for as long as he could remember. That word carried far too much weight in terms of how much it hurt him. The worst part was being called a demon despite having done nothing to truly harm anyone. When he finally arrived at his home, he went up to the room and shut the door. He slumped to the floor and screamed as he let out the tears he had been holding in. Why? What caused this to happen to me? He thought to himself as he sobbed into his hands. Why? 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 It's because of me. That deep voice was back, grabbing Naruto's attention as he realized he was back in the sewer. He noticed the fox had a sad expression on its face when he looked up. Naruto, I'm so sorry. This village would not have treated you this way if it hadn't been for me. Its tone was lighter and a little higher now. If only it had been someone else. If only it hadn't been you, you could have lived a normal life. Its voice began to sound higher pitched, almost feminine. It's all my fault, and you're suffering as a result. Naruto stopped her before she could continue. Are you a girl? She came to a halt when she realized her true voice had been heard. She sighed and nodded to him. Yes, my name is Naruto. I've been my entire life. She almost looked down in shame. That isn't relevant right now. What matters is that I'm sorry for everything bad that has happened to you as a result of my being trapped inside you. It's entirely my fault that they're evicting you from your home. Naruto's sobbing came to a halt when he heard the words your home. He paused for a moment to consider it. You're aware. When I was younger, I used to peer through the windows of other people's homes. She returned his gaze. I recall. I was always interested in how the parents treated their children with love and compassion. He went on. That was exactly what I was looking for. I desired to experience the warmth and love of others. I was a five-year-old living on the street, with villagers looking down on me and beating me for simply existing. He took a few deep breaths before proceeding. I used to believe that everyone in the world was like that. But the first time I truly left the village and went to Wave, I realized how wrong I was. Even before I helped save them from Gato, those people, Tezuna, Inari, and his mother all treated me with kindness. He returned his gaze to her, and she was taken aback by the determination in his eyes. I think I finally understand it. What did you get, Naruto? He stood up and wiped his tears away before returning his gaze to her. A home is not a place where everyone constantly hurts you. Before speaking to him again, the fox chuckled. So, Kit, what are you going to do? Naruto responded with a smile. I'm leaving this village for good, growing stronger than anyone, and carving out my own destiny far away from this hell. She gave him a smile and stood on her haunches. As she stood there, Naruto got a good look at her. Then, to make amends for the pain I've caused you your entire life, I'll do whatever I can to assist you, Naruto. He raised his head and smiled at her. Thanks, but I still don't know what to call you. She smiled at her again and leaned down. For the time being, call me Kyuubai. Naruto then smiled at Kyuubai before returning to his room. He stood up, his resolve strengthened. Naruto decided it was time to leave his dreadful room. 
Before looking out the window, he grabbed a backpack and began to fill it with clothes and equipment for himself. To his surprise, it was now nighttime and there was a full moon out. He also noticed lanterns and heard people celebrating something. Closer inspection revealed that word of his exile had spread and the villagers were celebrating. That was the breaking point. That's when Naruto realized without a doubt that this was never going to be his home. In disgust, Naruto decided to play one last prank on this village for all of his suffering and pain. Naruto was finally able to set up the explosive tags around his home and fireworks around the festival after some time and sneaking around. He had a few things to do before he lit them. The first thing he did was take off the headband Uruka had given him. He wouldn't need it now that he'd been exiled. He left it at the academy, along with a note on Uruka's desk. The last thing he wanted to do was confront his former sensei about the situation. The necklace Tsunade had given him came next. His ambition to become Hakage had died, so he might as well return this to her desk as well. To his surprise, neither she nor anyone else was in her office, so he left it, along with a note. His last mistake was seeing his friends one last time. He looked for them but only found a few of them at the festival. There were Sakura, Ino, Choji, Shikamaru, Kiba, Shino, Ten Ten, and even Neji and Lee. They appeared to be having a good time at the Fox Festival, unaware that the Fox Boy was watching them. That was all. There was no other reason to stay here any longer. Naruto clenched his teeth, activated both tags and the fireworks, and stood back as everyone panicked. It was satisfying to see the people's angry and confused expressions last time. Naruto then exited the area and proceeded to the gate. He didn't know where he was going or what he was going to do, but he knew he would never return to this village. He would keep his promise to become stronger than anyone else, and with Kyuubai's assistance, he would be able to live free and happy. With that in mind, Naruto left the village to make his own name and carve his own destiny. It had been three and a half years since Naruto had left the village, and he had grown significantly stronger. He'd discovered his elemental affinities were wind and water thanks to Kyuubai at the time, and had even learned to master them both. He was now extremely skilled in both and could even combine the two for more powerful ice techniques. Naruto was even able to learn the other elements because he did have a tailed beast inside of him with its own chakra. He began to enjoy using fire, was gradually mastering earth, and was learning how to use lightning. He was known in Jutsu Master by any means, but he was getting closer with each passing day. He was trying to avoid Jinjutsu because he wasn't very good at it. But Kyuubai persuaded him by saying that some of the best ninjas know at least how to cast and fight off Jinjutsu. She was a convincing and sometimes demanding teacher to the blonde, but she was also an excellent teacher. All of Naruto's decades, if not centuries, of experience paid off as she taught him. He could now cast a few Jinjutsu to fool others and, surprisingly, was quite good at it. His favorite part of training was Teijutsu. That's when he saw Kyuubai's human-like form and sparred with her. She would take on the appearance of a tall, slender woman who was both curvy and muscular. Her skin was a smooth tan color, and she had piercing red eyes, short crimson hair that was straight, fox ears that protruded, and nine tails that hung just above her firm bottom. She usually wore a kimono that was a little too big for her. The kimono was a deep red with an orange fox pattern on the back. It was simple and gave her enough space to move around. Naruto enjoyed this part of the training because he got to see her true form and fight her in a variety of styles. She knew a variety of styles and would spend at least a week training him in one at a time. When Naruto wanted to learn more styles, it was very helpful that they both knew the shadow clone technique. During his travels, Naruto decided to go west. During his travels, he became embroiled in a conflict between Kusagakure and Namgakure. It was there that he got his first kill. In Kusa, a named ninja attacked an innocent villager. Naruto paused before dispatching him with a kunai through the head. He knew he was now a part of this war when he saved that little girl and saw many ninja on both sides witness it. He learned Kenjutsu from a ninja who was also a former samurai during his time in Kyusa. Naruto was able to master Kenjutsu with his and Kyuubai's assistance and assist Kyusa in winning the war with aim in less than a year. He wields a blade he discovered during an Amgakure raid. The blade is a katana in blood red with a black handle and guard. That wasn't the strange part. The strange part was that there was an eye in the handle. Not just any ordinary eye, but a blood red demon eye. Kyuubai informed him that this sword was a demon blade, one of the rarest in the world. Naruto was able to wield it with ease thanks to her own demonic chakra. He gave it the name Akayakuma. He left to continue his quest for true strength after helping to end the war and becoming a hero to the people of Kyusa. Not wanting everyone to know that it was Naruto Uzumaki who helped end the war and rose to such prominence in such a short period of time, Naruto insisted on being referred to by a different name. 
As a result, he became known as the White Fox. The name was derived primarily from the mask he wore while in AIM, a white fox mask with piercing, dead white eyes. The bingo book classified him as an A-level ninja. That was a while ago, and Naruto was now walking through a forest. He was dressed in a dark orange long-sleeved shirt, a white undershirt, black cargo pants, and black ninja sandals. He had enjoyed his long walks in the forest, and since he didn't have a place to stay, he set up camp here. He pitched his tent and cooked some rabbits he had caught earlier before lying down and watching the night sky. Tonight was a clear, starry night, and it was times like these that made Naruto wonder how different his life would have been if he had left the village a long time ago. He's 16 now, and at least a very high jounin, but he couldn't help but wonder how far he'd come as a ninja if he was still in Kanoha. He sighed and decided to call it a night for the time being. His mind wandered as he slept, and he was back in his recurring nightmare. The one about his childhood days in Konoha and how people mistreated him. Every beating, every bit of abuse, every break-in, every rape, every torture is replayed in the teen's mind in perfect detail. Surprisingly, Naruto had grown accustomed to the nightmares. Tuyubai would always speak to him in order to make him feel better and to calm his mind. She was very concerned about him, which Naruto never expected from the most powerful and feared demon. The next morning, Naruto awoke to the sound of commotion not far away. He decided to investigate after quickly getting dressed after hearing screams from a few girls. Naruto was on his way out when he noticed five girls his age and a child of about eight or nine running away from several male bandits. The bandits' lustful gazes were drawn to the five, and Naruto could see why. The five girls were stunning, but this wasn't the time to admire them. As one of the bandits grabbed one of the girls, the blonde donned his mask and sprang into action. The girl was about her height, with tan skin and short orange hair. She was dressed in a tattered brown shirt and black shorts with no shoes. Her green eyes were filled with fear as she desperately tried to free herself from the man's grip, only for him to laugh and slap her hard. Naruto didn't waste any time. He sat down next to the man, and before either of them could react, Naruto had removed his head from his shoulders. The girl was taken aback, but she didn't question why this masked man was rescuing her. The remaining bandits, about nine of them, surrounded the other four girls and the child. They were all visibly scared, with the little girl desperately clinging to one of the girls. Eh, our little hunt appears to have come to an end here, fellas. According to one of the bandits, so boss, we're still going to. He rubbed his crotch toward the girls with his left hand. Do you want to have some fun before we take them back to town? A large burly bald man dressed casually walked over and stopped in front of the girls. He was grinning when he noticed something. Wasn't there supposed to be six of them? I only have five fingers. Another bandit grins and responds. One of our guys probably caught her and is having fun with her right now. The other girls paled visibly as they learned of their friend's fate. It was a terrible thing that these bandits were doing, and all they could do was stay close to one another and hope that someone would come to their rescue. Before any of the bandits could lay a hand on them, a body fell to the ground next to them, almost as if their prayer had been answered. They all recognized their comrade's body and gasped when they saw his head roll over to them. Who the hell dares to approach us? The group's leader yelled into the forest, expecting someone to respond. The other men prepared for an attack by spreading out a little. Nine guys, all bandits, with no skills. Naruto reflected as he stood near a bush, watching them all. As the girl stood behind him, he smirked behind his mask. This will be far too simple. What do you mean? When she saw the masked man vanish into thin air, she was cut off. She gasped in surprise before turning to face the other girls and bandits. The bandits were beginning to feel uneasy. It was a bright day outside, and anyone could be seen from above and all around. However, they were unable to locate whoever was present. Naruto enjoyed it. He liked sneaking up on bandits and low-level nin. Their panic and uneasiness always made him smile on the inside. He knew it was a little sadistic to play with your prey before killing it, but that could have been Kyuubai's influence. Naruto decided to pick one off loudly in order to cause some confusion. He moved silently through the trees until he was close to one of the bandits. He grabbed the back of the man's neck and yanked hard. The man let out a high-pitched scream before being dragged into the bushes. The other bandits heard this and noticed that the bush was now covered in blood. The bandits were shocked to see this, but they remained unconcerned. Naruto decided to take things to the next level. He climbed a tree and hid for a few seconds before capturing three of them, each with their own sword. The blonde shook his head as he observed their poor form and loose grips. Naruto dropped down in the center of them and landed in a crouching position, deciding to show the semen a real swordsman before they died. The three were taken aback at first, but that quickly changed when they saw the masked man reach for and unsheathe his own blade on his back. 
The three yelled as they rushed the man, but they were quickly dispatched. Before the last five arrived, Naruto leapt into the air in the trees. When they saw their comrades being slaughtered, they became terrified. Naruto had to bite his lip when he saw the last five bandits. He decided that now was the best time to annoy them. He stepped in front of the five, making them all jump in shock and then fear. The group's leader went wide-eyed when he saw the masked man, or more specifically, his mask. He took a step back as he realized who this person was. The boss, one of the bandits said as he began to tremble from the masked man's stare. What should we do? Their boss began to stutter. The FF fox in white. Oh. Naruto began by resting his blade on his shoulder and tilting his head slightly. So you've heard of me before. Good. Then you might be able to tell me what you worthless sacks of garbage were going to do to those girls. One of the bandits was unsure what to do and foolishly charged in panic. Naruto deflected his sword slash and slashed the man in half from the waist down. When the final four and the girls saw this, their jaws dropped. I guess I didn't make myself clear enough. Naruto began as he wiped his blade across the man's shirt. So I'll ask politely one more time. What were your plans for them? The boss determined that this job was not worth the infamous Wit Fox's death. This was meant to be a low-level position. Nobody was supposed to stop them, especially not someone from the bingo book. Look, we were just hired to pick up the girls and return them to their base, okay. Naruto cocked his head and pointed his sword at them. The four bandits flinched as a result. Who's the base? Just some prostitution and human trafficking rings. The manager spoke quickly. We'd just take a percentage of the profits when we brought them back. Where? Just a village in Earth's country. That's all we've got. So you're going to let us go. With a small smirk, the boss inquired. He reasoned that if he gave the white fox some information, he and the rest of his men would be spared. Unfortunately for him, if this was Naruto before the Kusa War, he might have been correct. When was the last time I said that? The white fox inquired. They exclaimed in horror and attempted to flee. They didn't get very far before sinking into the ground. Naruto approached their sinking forms, crouched down, and begged and pleaded with him. You were planning to rape and exploit them. I despise people who prey on the weak, but I despise rapists even more. You're all going to get this. And then the men were gone, and the forest was silent once more. Naruto sighed, knowing he had everything he needed. He was about to return to his belongings before traveling to Earth Country when he was stopped by the girls. One had long blonde hair, dark eyes, and fair skin. Another was a blonde with short hair and yellow eyes, in addition to her fair skin. The third had dark skin, shoulder-length black hair, and brown eyes. The fourth had blue hair that reached only to the top of her head, fair skin, and blue eyes that matched her hair. The little girl came last. She had white hair and eyes, as well as pale skin. Naruto looked around and saw that they were all staring at him in awe. You're the white fox, then. The blue-haired girl was taken aback. You're every bit as incredible as the rumors and aim made you out to be. Naruto smiled and folded his arms across his chest behind his mask. Thanks, it's always nice to meet some of your fans. And who are you all in the first place? My name is Akin. The girl with blue hair spoke up. Hello, my name is Hikari. The black-haired one responded. Hikaru, the girl with orange hair. My name is Toyoko. The long-haired blonde began, pointing to the other blonde hiding behind her. My name is Ayako, and this is Setsu, the little girl right here. Hikaru made a motion to the little girl. Setsu gazed up at Naruto, filled with wonder and awe. She was completely captivated by how he saved them and what he was about to do. Well, it's nice to finally meet you girls. Naruto began by nodding to them. I'd stay, but I have a base to destroy and others to hopefully assist. Naruto was stopped before he even took two steps. A hand on his shirt stopped him, and he turned to see that it was Setsu who had him. Naruto looked down at her and noticed that she now had a questioning expression on her face. Don't you have something inside you? She inquired of him. As he looked into her eyes, Naruto gasped beneath his mask. I can feel it. Something dark and powerful exists within you. She let him go and reached for his stomach seal. However, I'm curious as to what it is. Naruto grabbed her wrist and stopped her before she could make contact. Listen, Setsu, she said, looking up at him. I'm not sure how those eyes of yours work but you should be cautious when looking into someone. Setsu's eyes widened when she realized she couldn't look within this person anymore. She looked him in the eyes and slowly nodded. So, what exactly is the infamous white fox doing in a forest? Hikari inquired, folding her arms just below her impressive bust. I was just going about my business when I overheard all of this. It was a good warm-up, but I'm ready for a real workout now. Naruto turned to leave before being stopped again. We can take you to the village. Hikaru addressed him. Naruto returned his gaze to them, tilting his head. 
We'll show you where. All you have to do is promise to leave the leader for all of us. Naruto didn't understand but nodded anyway. With that, the group led Naruto through Earth Country to a small village, which caused Naruto's mask to growl slightly. There were men all over the village with women doing very degrading things for their own amusement. The men would force them to dance naked in front of them, force them into a pile of men for obvious reasons, and in some sicker cases, beat them with whips. Which one is in charge? He asked the girls who could feel the powerful Kai seeping from him. That man over there, Toyoko said, pointing down at a nin of some kind. Because the leader was the only ninja down there, Naruto would have an easier time deciding who not to kill. Naruto rose to his feet and cracked his neck before turning to face the girls. Stay put and do not move. I'll wrap this up quickly. He was gone in a shunshin before they could say anything. They looked down and waited to see what the white fox had in store for the bandits. After a few minutes, they began to hear screams as bandits were taken down by lightning strikes and strong winds. They watched as the bandits tried and failed to flee from what was going on around them. They were all torn apart by something too fast for them to see, leaving them in a daze of disorientation and confusion. What they were seeing terrified and even sickened the girls in the village. A blur was annihilating the bandits who had held them captive for so long, in very bloody ways. They watched the massacre from inside some of the buildings and even a few of the shacks and cages they were kept in. They could only see a white blur of some kind. The only one who wasn't touched was the ninja who tried to flee but was stopped by a kunai through his leg. He collapsed to the ground in agony as the sound of his men's screams faded into silence. He took out the kunai and attempted to repair himself, only to be stopped once more by a voice. I think I should just kill you right now. When the man looked up, he gasped in horror at who he saw. The white fox, a ninja who was said to have killed hundreds of AIM ninja during the Kusa AIM war, stood directly in front of him. The same ninja looked down at him, not a single scratch or speck of blood on his clothes. Now that Naruto was here in front of the ninja, he saw that he was in a sound uniform. This made his blood boil at seeing the same symbol that brought that traitorous Sasuke over to them and caused his banishment. Naruto had to take a few very deep breaths so he wouldn't just take out Akai Akuma and send this nin to hell. If it were up to me, I would kill you now and be done with it. Naruto started. But that's not for me to decide now, is it? With that, Naruto turned away from the sound nin and that was when Setsu and the others came towards him. The nin had no time to prepare for his death as he was too terrified to really do or say anything. Setsu stood in front of him and knelt closer to his face. The nin tried to swing at her with a kunai in hand, but was stopped by Naruto grabbing his arm and snapping it like a twig. Setsu, no longer distracted, gazed into the man's eyes and her white eyes turned into a deep black color with white pupils. The nin started to convulse violently and his eyes rolled completely behind his head. In a matter of seconds, he started to foam at the mouth and then stopped moving at all. Naruto was amazed by whatever Setsu did as her eyes changed back to white. He would have to ask her about it later though as now a few eyes were steadily focused on him. Naruto looked around for a brief moment and noticed that every girl was staring at him in both awe and thanks. The ones in cages had been freed and the ones hurt were now being treated as best as they could. Naruto, thinking that his job here was done, decided to take his leave, but before he could, he was stopped by more than a few girls who wanted to thank him. He was just a bit uncomfortable at first, since he really had no clue how to really talk to girls like this, so he just decided to wing it and just be himself. Hours later, night time. It took some time, but with the few very healthy and the help of the white fox's many clones, the dead bodies had been moved away to be burned up. Naruto rather enjoyed helping this village and its residents clean the place up of all the blood bodies. It was nice to get to know some of the girls that would casually speak to him like everything was normal. Some of the repeated questions were of course asked, like where was he from, did he really kill that many Aemnin, and what was his real name? Naruto would answer the first two but would always hesitate when it came to the last one. He debated in his head for all those hours until Kyuubai decided to speak for the first time today. You should at least take the mask off, she said to him in a calm tone. You really think so, Kyuubai? Naruto asked her, still a little hesitant of it all. Look, they're heavily in your debt for saving them from a life that would only end in either death or a lust-filled haze they would never escape. Kyuubai continued, they won't care who you really are. They would just love to see the face of the one who saved them all and not a mask and title. Naruto sighed as her words made sense to him. You're right Kyuubai. Thanks. Kyuubai chuckled a bit before fading from his thoughts to rest again. When she did, Naruto let out a sigh and decided to take off his mask. Before he did, Hikaru found him. Hey there white fox. She started in a friendly tone. Look, I don't know if you'll be staying here for a little festival we're having a little later, but you know it would be nice if you at least stayed for it. 
Naruto put his finger to his masked chin in a thinking pose. Hmm, well I was planning on just wandering around until I found something to do, so sure, I can stay for a bit. Hikaru smiled and nodded to him. Then it's good to have you here White Fox. No, he said to her, confusing the girl for a bit. That was when he reached for his mask and removed it, revealing himself to her. Hikaru was stunned by how he looked. The spiky blonde hair, the sky blue eyes, and the whiskers adorning his face. He smiled at her, causing the orange-haired girl to blush. Call me Naruto. Many years later, a young boy was wandering around town by himself, but it didn't bother him in the least. He walked down the street, his short blonde hair with red tips flowing in the wind. His light red eyes with slitted blue pupils, fair skin, and two whisker marks on each side of his face were an all-too-familiar sight to the residents of the small village. He was dressed in black shorts and an open dark orange jacket that revealed a white undershirt. As he approached a stand on the side of the street he was walking on, the boy smiled broadly. He was greeted by a teenage girl with pale skin, white eyes, and mid-back hair. She turned to face the boy, who was sitting on a stool in front of her stand. Hey there, Boruto-kun, the girl said to the boy who had become Boruto. How are you doing? Boruto gave her a small chuckle before responding. I've been doing fine, Setsu Obachan. Just came over to get a new book for Akira. She blows through these things so quickly it's hard to believe she's only five. Setsu chuckled under her breath as she rummaged through her library. She had previously loaned Boruto a few of her books with the expectation that he would return them within a week. But Akira would usually finish them in a day. It made her laugh, but it also made her wonder how many of these books that little girl had read by now. Setsu decided to drop it for the time being and handed Boruto a book about Sonagakure's history that might keep her busy for more than a day. Boruto thanked one of his many aunts before departing from the book stand. As he left the village area and entered the forest, he saw many familiar faces. He's always been drawn to the forest where he and his family lived since he was a child. His mother may not be as fond of the forest as Boruto and Akira, but she did enjoy watching the two play with their father in the trees all the time. Boruto had always felt at ease in the treetops that led to and even surrounded his home. It was something he couldn't put his finger on, but it just felt right. He adored nature, the animals, and the peace it brought. Akira is the same way. Boruto was moving through the branches to his usual route home when he heard a voice above him and knew who it was. Oenii Chan yelled a little girl as she landed on her brother's back to surprise him. The girl was about half his size, with bright blue eyes and burnt red hair. Her skin was a light tan, and she had a whisker mark on each side of her cheek. She was dressed in a bright red shirt that reached her ankles, covering her plain shorts and sandals. Boruto easily regained his footing and held on to her as he continued on. Hey there, Akira-chan, Boruto said as he continued walking. He handed her the book as he drove by more trees at a reasonable speed. Look what Setsu Obachan gave me. Akira's face lit up when she saw a new book to read. She grabbed it and thanked her brother as he walked home with her. They arrived at their destination after a few minutes. It was a standard-sized house that could accommodate a group of people. The house was white with a red roof and plants around and beneath the windows. On the side of the structure, there was also a small garden with some unusual fruits and vegetables growing from it. A visible river of clear water ran through the forest not far from the garden. There was a clear field in the backyard that stretched for acres and had a few craters from their mother and father's sparring sessions. Both Naruto and the two's mother were sitting on a porch near the garden, looking out onto the calm waters. Naruto had changed a little in these years of peace. He wore his spiky blonde hair past the back of his neck and had a white streak on the right side of his head, had three seal contracts tattooed on parts of his body that weren't visible to the naked eye, was a foot or so taller than before and had a red fox tattoo on the left side of his neck that reached to his left shoulder. He was dressed in a black long-sleeved sweater and orange cargo pants. The mother was, of course, the Kyuubai herself. Kyuubai had begun to express her feelings toward the blonde after a year or so of training together after saving Hikaru and the others. He accepted her and admitted to caring for her, much to her surprise. After they admitted it to each other, Kyuubai requested that Naruto call her by her given name, Kirama. Naruto even removed most of the seal to allow her to fully retain her human form and physically live with him. Aside from the yellow fox tattoo on the right side of her neck that stretched all the way to her right shoulder, her crimson hair was longer, and she kept her tails hidden unless in battle. She wore a simple red dress that reached her ankles and no shoes. She was actually sleeping peacefully on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto noticed their children had returned and shushed them so their mother wouldn't wake up. The two noticed this and approached them quietly. Kausen, Boruto said quietly. 
We're back, and I've got a new book for Akira. Naruto smiled at the two as Akira enthusiastically held up the book. He gave them a quick thumbs up and motioned them inside to prepare for dinner. They nodded and went inside, leaving him with his wife who was still sleeping. He roused her with a gentle nudge of his shoulder. Hey, it's dinner time, he said softly in a slightly deeper voice. Kirama yawned on his shoulder without opening her eyes. You smell nice, she said, tiredly. Naruto smirked and rubbed her hair and ears in response to the compliment. So I've been told, he teased, placing his lips on her brow. Are you ready to eat? She lifted her head from his shoulder and looked him in the eyes. Carry me, she said, her face still tired. Naruto chuckled under his breath before lifting her up bridal style. He carried her inside, and the four of them sat down to eat. Kanoha, things haven't been going well in the Hidden Leaf Village for a while. Some of their alliances were shattered after Naruto was exiled. Because of a certain blonde, the Wave, Suna, and even some other villages agreed to form an alliance with Kanoha. They still had allies, but Suna was their main bulk, and they were vulnerable without her. Add to that the fact that they had banished their own Jinchuriki, and the fear felt by other villages had vanished. They were embroiled in a conflict with both Kumagakure and Otagakure, with Aimdakure in talks with Kumo about joining forces to crush the leaf. Konoha and the two have been at odds for years, with the two steadily gaining ground with each passing day. Most of the village was taken aback when the last loyal Uchiha joined Orochimaru in sound in their effort to destroy the leaf. The council was furious at this betrayal and had Sasuke placed in the bingo book. Following Naruto's exile, Tsunade resigned as Hakage and left Konoha with Shizune. Kekashi was appointed 6th Hokage and has had no real authority since. Let's just say that Kanoha's situation worsened as a result of the elders in the council. Kekashi is now in his office, looking out over the depressing village he calls home. Most of the villagers hadn't been outside in a long time due to the constant threat of invasion. The streets were normally deserted, and a dark cloud hung over the village at the time. Kakashi sighed as he realized he needed to find a way to instill confidence in the villagers and even the shinobi who stayed in the village. He had no idea what to do now and looked up at the fourth Hakage head on the mountainside. He sighed in disappointment, realizing how much he had embarrassed himself and failed the village, as well as his sensei. A knock on his door jolted him out of his reverie, and he quickly regained his composure. Enter, he said, trying not to crack his voice. When the door opened, a few familiar faces entered. Asuma and his team, as well as Kuranai and her team, entered. After all those years, the majority of the former genin had now become chunin and had remained a team in this time of war. Only Shikamaru, however, was a jounin. The eight looked to their Hakage, who had a mission for them all that was critical. As you are all aware, we are at war with Kumo and Odo, he began, clasping his hands together and placing them on the desk. We're at a disadvantage, and with both Orochimaru and Sasuke in the fray, we're going to need more allies. If AIM joins those two, Kanoha, our home, will fall without stronger reinforcements. There was a grim tone in the room after hearing this. Now I'm dispatching you all to Earth Country to find us more allies. I've even heard rumors of the infamous White Fox being somewhere on Earth. If you can persuade him to join us, AIM will not join Kumo and Odo. There was a bit of a gasp in the room at the mention of the White Fox. Most had read about the war between Aim and Kusa all those years ago, and how one man, or according to some, a true demon, had ripped Aim apart with ease. The Shinobi of Aim now made it clear that if you see the White Fox, all you should do is pray he kills you quickly. Hakage-sama, Ino began. Are you certain the White Fox would even assist us? Kakashi shook his head in dismay. I highly doubt it, but if you all find him, try to persuade him as best you can. I don't care how you do it, just get him and others to help us in this time of war. Asuma began, understood Hakage-sama. When are we leaving? In two hours. Good luck to you all, this mission should take at most two weeks, Kakashi said. They left his office and prepared to travel to Earth. Outside of Kanoha, two hours later, the group of eight had broken into conversation as they made their way to Earth country. So, what do you think about this whole thing? Kiba inquired of his companions as the senseis approached. If you want my honest opinion, Kiba, Shikamaru began, I think this will be a little difficult. How come you say that? Ino inquired of her teammate. For one thing, we have to go over to Earth country in the hopes of securing an alliance to help in the war. And you all know how Iwanin feel about the leaf, so for the most part, we're tasked with finding this white fox guy to take aim out of the equation, Shikamaru explained. There's another reason the Hakage sent us all to Earth, but it's just a theory for the time being. And exactly what would that be? Choji inquired of his best friend. Shikamaru replied, there was a rumor that Naruto was somewhere in Earth country. Everyone had a mixed reaction to this. Hinata had almost fallen off the tree she was moving through when she heard the name of the man she loved. 
Shino's eyes widened as he heard this information. Tiba simply held his head down as Choji and Ino gasped. Most of them went to the festival after his banishment night. They had no idea what was going on until the fireworks in Naruto's apartment caught fire. They had no idea about his exile until that happened. Following the explosion, they learned from one of the Anbu that Naruto had seen them at the festival. He probably thought they were also celebrating his exile, which made the majority of the group feel terrible. So, Shikamaru continued, If Naruto is somewhere on Earth, we have to bring him back no matter what. One week later, Naruto and his family had gone for a walk to the village to get some groceries. The people of the village greeted them all because almost everyone there knew him. Because it wasn't widely known that Kirama was a nine-tailed fox, she got mostly normal looks from everyone. Following Naruto's years of service to the people of the small village, the entire area was renovated. It wasn't large enough to be called a village by any means, but it was large enough to house every single woman involved in what happened years ago. While Baruto was running around, Akira was perched on her father's shoulders, reading her latest book on musical instruments. He was always full of energy, which was probably due to the fact that he possessed so much of Kirama's and Naruto's chakra. Surprisingly, he always had a lot of energy in himself as a result of this. Kirama clutched Naruto's hand as they walked through the village looking for groceries. Boruto had run away from his family as they were doing this. Naruto and Kirama were both unconcerned because he knew his way around and everyone knew him, so there was nothing to be concerned about. Boruto had decided to go back into the forest and have some fun while the rest of his family was at home. He jumped from tree to tree, getting higher and higher and higher until he reached the very top. He stood on a large protruding branch and gazed out into the distance while he was there. Boruto was always curious about what lay beyond Earth's borders. Akira would tell him about other villages and completely different places she had read about. But there was a difference between hearing about it in a book and seeing it for yourself. Boruto was unaware that he was being watched as he gazed out into the distance. Two men dressed in dark ninja garb were passing by another tree when they noticed the kid. The two ninja were Kumo Nin and appeared battered and bruised due to their nearly broken appearance. Did you see that kid? One of them asks. He had several nasty cuts on his body as well as deep bite marks from some kind of large creature. Yeah, grunts that one. He had several deep cuts on his arms and back, but he was still able to move. If there's a kid here, it means there's a village where we can hide. Good. I think we got rid of those ninjas. I can't believe they found out we were trying to expand to Earth, said the first. I'll grab the kid and ask him to show us where the village is. When we heal up, we'll bring more men there to subjugate it as ours. We'll need the outpost. However, they heard a rustling behind them as he was saying this. They leaped off the branch as quickly as they could toward the boy, just as a large dog and a teen leaped at them. The dog was massive after failing to snap its powerful jaws on one of the ninja. Both Kumo ninja tensed up and decided to throw Kanai at the beast and its master, only to be met by a wall of flies. The rest of the Konoha nin appeared from the other trees at that point. The nin with the deep bite mark quickly threw a smoke bomb at the group. This had no effect as the big dog pounced on the other man teeth digging into his neck. Haha, <laughs> great job, Akamaru, Kiba exclaimed, only to realize the other nin had vanished. Where did he? Choji began, but Akamaru growled above them. They all looked up to see the man holding a boy who resembled someone else they were looking for. When they saw the boy, they all froze, especially Hinata. His blonde hair, despite the red tips at the ends, and whisker marks reminded everyone of Naruto. When the Kumo Nin wrapped his arm around Boruto's neck and held up a kanai to his red eyes, he began to snicker. I'm walking out of here, Konoha scum, don't follow me or the brat will die. None of the Konoha ninja moved a muscle for fear of injuring the boy who might know where Naruto is. Perhaps it was Naruto in a henge. But, if that's true, why isn't he fighting back? Dude, when my Towson shows up, you're in big trouble. Boruto yelled, shocking the group even more. They began to suspect that his father was Naruto, but the Kumo Nin didn't mind because he was about to stab the boy in the eye. But before anyone could intervene, a blur passed through them and grabbed the Kumo Nin by the throat. Boruto landed on a nearby branch after he was dropped. The Kumo Nin was wheezing heavily as the figure in dark pants, a white shirt, and plain sandals clutched him in a death grip. The group was in a state of shock after discovering their long-lost friend. The blonde hair remained, he was taller now, and the girls blushed at how his ripped muscles were visible as his shirt hugged him tightly. Surprisingly, Kirinai blushed in his presence. Not surprisingly, Hinata and Ino were both staring at him from the nosebleeds. Boruto, Naruto said to his son, capturing his attention. Are you alright? Boruto gave him a thumbs up and a wide-eyed grin. 
Baruto mimicked the grin before turning serious and looking at the Kumo Nin who was nearly unconscious in his grasp. Baruto held him for a few more seconds before letting gravity take its course. The Kumo Nin crashed through the trees all the way to the ground floor. Wow, Towson. Baruto exclaimed as he and Naruto looked down at where the Nin had struck. That was fantastic. Before hearing his son's name called from behind him, Naruto ruffled his son's hair. Naruto-kun. Hinata inquired softly. Naruto turned to see the eight standing there, dumbfounded by his presence. He hadn't given them much thought because he was more concerned with his son. So it came as quite a surprise to Naruto to see them all there in front of him after nearly all these years. Huh? He began hesitantly. Hello, guys. Naruto turned when he heard his name being called by a familiar voice after dealing with the Kumo Nin and checking on his son. To his surprise, the voice that called his name happened to be one of his old former classmates from when he was a kid. He took his time looking at her and the other Konoha Nin he hadn't seen or thought of in years, taking the time to get a good look at them all. The former Genin he once knew had grown quite a bit, but everyone's reaction to seeing him was the same right now. Shock, Naruto, on the other hand, had little reaction to them. Naruto simply placed a hand on Boruto's shoulder and both father and son vanished without a word. The Konoha group was stunned by what he had just done and Asuma quickly ordered everyone to find Naruto. Thoughts were racing through their heads as he gave that order and everyone scattered. What happened to that child? Has he been here since the beginning? What has he done all these years? How strong and quick has he become to be able to move like that? But the most important question came from Hinata after a realization struck her. If that boy is Naruto father, Kun's who was the whore who took away my dream of being with my Naruto Kun. She began shocked and stunned, but with that constant thought, her shock gradually turned to rage. Rage towards whoever the whore was who took Naruto and her dream of bearing his children from her. He knew he wasn't fast enough to keep up with Naruto with Shikamaru. That was far faster than any of them. Maybe if they had Lee and his restraints were removed, and he opened one of his gates, he could catch up with Naruto. Shikamaru had calculated long before they arrived in Earth Country that if they found Naruto, he would most likely have already moved on. Maybe you even started a family and were living happily ever after. It appears that his theory about a family was correct. If that was true, and he was living peacefully somewhere in a village, who were they to take that away from him? That's for sure not his friends. Kiba had been searching for Naruto's scent since he had left the group earlier, but had come up empty-handed. It was almost as if his scent had vanished. Kiba and Akamaru came to a halt at the entrance to a village populated primarily by girls, women, and traveling entertainers. When the two entered, they became the center of attention. For the village, seeing a ninja was unusual, and seeing a massive dog accompanying said ninja was even more unusual. Kiba and Akamaru ignored the stairs and concentrated on finding Naruto, and the boy they thought was his cub. Despite their superior tracking abilities, they had a difficult time locating said blonde in this village. It was almost as if his scent lingered everywhere, confusing the two to no end. Before they could continue their so far fruitless search, Asuma and Ino appeared beside them. Have you found him yet, Kiba? Ino inquired of the Inn Yuzuka. Nothing, Kiba replied. It's almost as if he's been everywhere around her too many times for me to count, Akamaru. Well, if that's the case, Asuma began as he approached a woman working at a stand. Excuse me, but have you seen someone with blonde hair walking around with a child who has nearly the same blonde hair? Asuma wanted to be vague in his description to this civilian. Unfortunately for him and the others, his obscurity wasn't all that great in comparison. Oh, you mean Naruto and his son Boruto, the woman enlightens the Jounin. Actually, yes, they went back to their home just in that direction in the forest, she said, pointing to Naruto's house and smiling at the ninja. Thank you, Asuma said, bowing to her. He and his two students took off running in the direction of Naruto's house. They were having difficulty because the forest was dense and it would be all too easy for anyone to become lost here. Fortunately for them, they leapt into the trees and gained a better view of the surroundings. They noticed a white house in the distance with plants all around it and a clearly visible lake not far away. There, Asuma said to the two, urging them to hurry up. As they landed in a clearing in front of the house, they noticed Naruto and the child now known as Boruto approaching the front door. Naruto, Hiba exclaimed to the blonde. Naruto sighed and turned to face the three people in front of his house. He gave them an impassive look that made Kiba and Ino's heart sink a little. He crossed his arms and kept his gaze on the group, while Boruto simply stood there, watching. The others appeared next to Ino, Kiba, and Asuma before anyone else could say anything. They all got a good look at Naruto as he reached into his pockets to examine them all. 
The group, while excited to see their long-lost friend, was a little heartbroken by his impassive glare. When the front door opened to reveal a slender woman with tanned skin and long crimson hair and eyes, Hinata took a step forward to speak to her Naruto-kun. Before seeing the Konoha ninja in front of them, she looked to her husband and son. Kirama had to maintain her normalcy for obvious reasons, and she had to appear surprised or troubled to see the ninjas here but in her mind she was grinning devilishly. Because their minds are linked in any case, Naruto couldn't help but laugh. Kirama noticed the Hyuga standing in front of the group with a shocked and horrified expression on her face and had to fight the urge to grin at the girl in triumph of claiming her mate for herself. Naruto-kun, Kirama began in a sweet and innocently fake tone that fooled no one. What exactly is going on out here? Naruto sighed once more as he replied. Nothing more than the past trying to catch up with me. Naruto, Asuma began as he walked past Hinata, who was still stunned. He took a step onto the porch and immediately regretted it when a massive amount of killer intent slammed into him like a ton of bricks. He could feel himself collapsing if he stayed any closer to the house, so he moved away and the pressure went away. Asuma looked at the blonde with wide eyes, beginning to breathe heavily. I'm not sure why all of you are here when you have a war to fight or how you found me, but here's some advice, Naruto said as he led his family back inside. He turned his head, and the glare he gave them sent shivers down their spines. Go and don't come back. Before they could say anything, Naruto shut the door and a powerful release of killing intent descended on them. Only this one stood out to Asuma. Naruto's killing intent was already heavy and breathtaking, but this, this felt like death itself was desperately trying to grab you and drag you into the fiery depths of the afterlife. The others felt this sensation and, for a brief moment, saw something that filled them with genuine fear. When they looked up, the sky was blood red, and screams could be heard from all directions. There was blood all over the place, and they could see countless bodies lying at their feet. Kumo Nin, Aim Nin, Odo Nin, and Kanoha Nin are all dead in the most gruesome ways imaginable. They all paled and turned to leave, but before they did, they noticed the Kyuubai no Kitsune himself standing tall over the dead near the house. It looked at them, bared its razor-sharp and bloody teeth in a snarling grin, and spoke one word to them all that caused more than a few to pass out from the force of the voice. Run, and with that, everything returned to normal. There were no bodies or blood, the sky was clear, and Naruto's house was exactly the same as before. The sight of the calm and peaceful house and surroundings chilled all eight ninja, students and senseis alike. They all fled out of fear of whatever that powerful Jinjutsu was. Shikamaru and Kirinai, for example, had a similar thought. Naruto, when did you learn such a powerful Jinjutsu? When they returned to the small village area, panting and slightly uneasy, they stopped in front of a book stand, where a white-haired girl recognized them. Oh, you must all be Naruto friends, since she said softly to the group. They noticed how calm she was when they looked at her. Was that Jinjutsu extended and no one here was affected? or was it simply placed on the group? You know him, Kiba inquired, still a little shaken by the Jinjutsu. Of course, she replied, everyone recognizes Naruto-san. He saved us all years ago. Did you save you all? Asuma inquired, his face puzzled. Setsu's smile faded for a moment before she returned to tell them the story. Well, years ago, most of the people in this village were involved in a human trafficking and prostitution ring run by bandits and a ninja. A few of us, myself included, managed to escape the camp, but we didn't get very far before we were surrounded. That's when Naruto-san showed up and slaughtered the bandits while also freeing the rest of us in this village. He showed no mercy to them and even let me deal with the leader. Anyway, after that, Naruto-san decided to stay here and raise a family after taking off that mask. Mask? Shino inquired. Which mask? Setsu was perplexed for a moment before noticing the looks on the Kanoha nin's faces. She smirked a little, a curious gleam in her white eyes, before answering them. Well, he was previously known as the White Fox. To say the Kanoha ninja were taken aback and shocked would be an understatement. How did Kanoha's number one hyperactive, knucklehead ninja become the infamous and ruthless White Fox that Aim was terrified of? The thought itself was completely absurd. Wasn't that the case? Could Naruto really change that much after being exiled? Setsu's smirk was adorned with a very dark look as the group pondered this. A look that made the Kanoha group wonder how much she knew and why she was staring at them in this way. She finally decided to address their concerns. I don't know much about Naruto past, Sans, but one thing he told me that I found very interesting is his disdain for the village hidden in the leaves, she said, pointing to the hit I ate. And judging by the fact that you all wore the same symbol and fled from his home, I'm guessing he didn't enjoy your company. Her tone was one of deliberate insult to the Kanoha group. 
They return their gaze to Setsu before returning to the path that led to Naruto's house. So he has a family now? Choji asked, struggling to regain his composure. Yes, Setsu replied. I'm not sure where his wife came from, but he has two children, a son and his younger daughter. Setsu chuckled before continuing. You should all return to your village. I highly doubt Naruto-san will assist you in your war. The group turned to look at Setsu, only to find that she was no longer there and they decided that going back was probably the best idea. So they walked away from the path and out of the village, all the while trying to regain some composure from the Jinjutsu, and the realization that Naruto Uzumaki was indeed the White Fox. Back in Naruto's residence, Naruto had to fight the urge to punch a hole in the wall for two reasons. One, he didn't want his children to see this side of him. And two, Kirama would kill him if he did anything to their home out of rage. He sat down on a couch and tried his hardest not to think about what had just happened today. Just as he closed his eyes, he felt his wife's hand on his shoulder. He opened his eyes and saw. Are you alright? She asked in hushed tones. Naruto smiled at her and cupped her face with his hand to bring her closer, planting a gentle kiss on her lips before lowering her to sit next to him. Yeah, he said quietly, I'm fine. I'll never go back there as long as I have you guys. Really? You promised you won't go back there, Odalson? Akira asked as she sat next to her father and looked up at him with pleading eyes. You promised you won't go back there, Odalson? Boruto sat next to his younger sister, nodding his head in determination at her words. It brought a smile to Naruto's face as he hugged his little girl, and she hugged back. Don't worry about me. Guys, Naruto said, I plan on staying here for a long time. A few days later, Konoha. The eight Konoha ninja had finally returned to Konoha. It took a full two days for the shock and after effect of the Jinjutsu to wear off, but they were finally home. They quickly made their way back to the Hakage's office to inform him of what they had discovered in Earth Country, only to see Sekura and Team Guy return as well. I take it you all have news for me. Kakashi joked, masking his tiredness and frustration at the council. Hakage-sama, we found Naruto, Asuma said as he took a step forward. The mere announcement surprised the Hokage, Team Guy, and especially Sakura. She had lost both of her teammates in the span of one week and was now a part of a newly formed Team 7 with a new sensei, and everything. It wasn't the same in Konoha for her without Naruto. She perked up at his name, but then she saw her fellow ninjas heard expressions and her heart sank a little. Where is he then? She wondered. Is he waiting outside or Kirinai cut her off? He's still on Earth, in a small village. He has a family and is living peacefully with no plans to return. Hearing this news, Kirinai had to turn her head away from Sakura's broken expression. He's also the white fox, Shikamaru said to the still-stunned Kakashi, eliciting the desired reaction from everyone else in the room who wasn't on Team Asuma or Kirinai. Someone in the village told us everything about how he saved the villagers from bandits and a sound ninja years ago as the white fox. He now resides in the area with his wife and children. Is Naruto-kun married? Lee inquired, surprised. Shikamaru nodded to Lee, and Kakashi sighed aloud. Everyone else, with the exception of Sakura, turned to their leader, saying, The council is not going to be happy about this. Room for a council meeting. And, indeed, they were not. How could that demon brat deny he was assisting us? He should be thankful for everything we've done for him. There's no way that monster is anyone's hero. If anything, he should be pleading with us all to return here. Bring that demon back to where he belongs. Hell no. Enough. Kakashi yelled to the civilian council, having had enough of their bickering and refusing to let them call out his former student-turned-war hero. You all claim all of this when it was all of you who had him banished in the first place. This is your punishment for your arrogance and selfishness, and the village will suffer as a result of it all. Kakashi's words had an impact on the shinobi side of the council, but not so much on the civilians. Unfortunately, a certain bandaged-up elder had other ideas. Danzo sat in his chambers after the meeting, enraged at how his plans had fallen apart. He needed Naruto to be banished so he could coerce the boy into joining his side. But those plans changed when his root Anbu couldn't find him anywhere almost as if he had vanished off the face of the planet. Sai, he said, and the pale teen Rudanbu appeared kneeling. Hello, Danzo-sama. Sai responded emotionlessly. I'm going to need you and a few more of my route to go to Earth Country, Danzo said, noting Sai's raised eyebrow. I'll need the Jinchuriki for my plans to come to fruition. And if he doesn't come willingly, he stood, a sinister grin on his face, then we'll have to see how much he truly loves those precious children of his. Unbeknownst to Danzo, a small snake slithered away from his room to deliver a very interesting message to its master, Orochimaru. Base of Orochimaru, a snake slithers as fast as it can back to its master deep within the tunnels beneath sound. The snake slithered through a room before freezing in fear. 
It turned its head to see a dark figure approaching it slowly. Before the figure could get any closer, a new voice announced its gifts. Oh well, my spy came back earlier than expected. The voice drew the attention of both the snake and the figure. They turned to see the snake Sanon slowly approaching them, his ever-present grin on his face. And what was it that was so important that you defied my orders to return within a month? It's only been one week. Orochimaru, despite his calm demeanor, was not pleased with this. The snake quickly responded with a few hisses, and the figure noticed that Orochimaru was giving one of his intense glares. The figure kept listening and watching as the Sanin began to chuckle under his breath for a few seconds before bursting out laughing. What exactly did it say? The figure inquired, a little irritably. Orochimaru paused in his cackle to address him with a sinister smile. He was just telling me about your old teammate being found. Sasuke. Sasuke emerged from the shadows, his brow furrowed slightly. His blood was boiling just thinking about that dobe's name. It wasn't enough that Naruto's move at the Valley of the End nearly trumped his Chidori all those years ago, but he also nearly beat Sasuke with it. When he heard about his old rival's exile, Sasuke snickered, assuming that he would simply crawl under a bridge and die a slow and painful death alone. However, following Naruto's exile, the blonde simply vanished from the ninja world. This is the first piece of information about the blonde since that fateful day. Come, Sasuke began with an arrogant grin. So, what exactly made you laugh like a lunatic? The final Acha leaned against the door frame. His arms crossed. Even with the phony insult, Orochimaru maintained his smirk and responded. Danzo appears to have forgotten his place and is aware of the Yuzumaki's whereabouts. He's dispatching his rude Anbu to get the boy's attention, and the only way to do so appears to be to kidnap his children. Sasuke's eyes widened before clenching his teeth in rage at that point. How? How could that dobe possibly have children? How could he possibly find happiness after his exile? Sasuke's sharing and flared up with rage just thinking about it. And what exactly do you intend to do about it? Sasuke said with clenched teeth. Orochimaru's grin broadened as he spoke the next words. Well, if the boy could be dealt with, it would be extremely beneficial to my own plans. And I believe his small children would be excellent leverage as well. As he easily put together what the Sanin was asking him to do, Sasuke developed a devious and evil grin. Several days later, Naruto and Akira were walking to a clearing not far from his house. She'd been bugging him about her eyes turning red ever since those Konoha nin showed up. Rather than asking her mother to explain everything, she kept bugging her father to spend more time with him. Naruto figured out why his daughter stayed so close to him in the back of his mind. In her mind, she expected her father to remain with her, her brother, and her mother indefinitely, as he had promised. But Naruto was unconcerned. In a way, he thought it was adorable to see her act like this. They arrived at a clearing, where Naruto sat next to a tree and motioned for Akira to join him. She pouted before sitting on his lap with her arms crossed. She was still sulking as they sat beneath the tree, watching the gentle breeze blow through the grass. Naruto had a smile on his face as he watched but it faded slightly when he saw the expression on his daughter's face. She was looking down, a slightly worried expression on her face. Naruto noticed this and noticed that she was crying. Naruto sighed and stroked her lovely hair as he spoke to her gently. This wasn't about you asking me about your eyes, Akira. Akira remained silent as she drew closer to her father. Naruto could tell she was in some sort of mourning since that day. Akira, Naruto began as he held her gently. Did you notice that out there? Akira didn't look up at first to see what her father wanted her to see. She looked up to her father's smiling face after a few seconds of sniffling and gave a tiny smile. Naruto pointed to an open field, and Akira looked out, wide-eyed at the sight. The land in front of her was breathtakingly beautiful. The valley was peaceful, with lush green stretching as far as the eye could see towards the forest. A spectacle that almost made Akira forget why she was on the verge of tears. She looked out at the still gentle wind blowing through the grass and leaves falling to the ground around them. It was a truly breathtaking sight to behold. Akira, Naruto began to speak to her while holding her in his arms. She looked up to see her father's calm grin as he continued. Have you ever wondered why my Kasan and I came here? Akira shrugged her shoulders. No, it was because we came here and saw something that we had both been wanting for a long time. Naruto replied, smiling as he looked out over the valley. Exactly what, Tusan? Akira inquired. A new chance to begin. Naruto replied while looking around. A chance to live without worrying about the past or lamenting our failures. A chance to do something we both wanted to do for a long time. A household. He said that last part as he looked down at Akira, who had begun to cry. As he continued, Naruto cupped her face with both hands and wiped away her tears. My world revolves around you and Baruto. 
I adore your Kasan with all of my heart, and nothing will ever come between me and you three. I love you all, I love this place, I love our home, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Akira. Okay. Akira became teary-eyed, but nodded slowly to her father before throwing herself on him. She sobbed into her father's chest as she hugged him tightly. Naruto simply embraced her and stoked her hair, cooing into her ears. They remained like this for a few minutes until Akira abruptly stopped crying and raised her head to meet his gaze. Naruto was taken aback when he saw the determination and resolve in those bright blue eyes. Sure, they had tears in their sides that made her look too cute, but she was determined nonetheless. Can I then become as strong as you, too, Sam? She inquired, surprising her blonde father for a brief moment before he smiled. Of course you can, Akira says. He said this to her as he rubbed her head playfully, earning her a big tooth smile. If you want, my mother and I will even train you. There are some things that we must teach you. Naruto grabbed Akira and dodged a few shuriken that came from the forest shadows before he could finish his sentence. The shuriken kept coming, and Naruto kept dodging them with ease, despite Akira's fear. Akira, Naruto began with a stern tone that drew his daughter's attention. It's fine, I've got you covered. Her father's smirk was enough to reassure her as he landed and dodged another wave of shuriken. He kept avoiding until one almost hit his daughter. That was a bad decision. Naruto snatched the shuriken from a strand of Akira's hair and threw it at its attacker almost too quickly for the attacker to dodge. Naruto recognized the attacker as an anbu from Konoha when he fell to the ground from a tree. A root anbu, to be exact. The shuriken had passed cleanly through anbu's mask and through his skull. Before Naruto could say anything else, he was surrounded by at least 20 rude anbu. They all wore black cloaks and wore white masks of various animals. Yuzumaki Naruto. As he stepped forward, one of the root, a man in a falcon mask, spoke. Our mission is to ensure Konoha's cooperation in the war between us and our enemies. Will you submit and join us in peace? Naruto sat Akira down while he searched for an opening. Akira clung to his pants leg in fear of these men. Aside from the Konoha group that came by and a few passerby nin who were very friendly to the village, she had never seen ninja before. But this was different. Even with her father present to reassure her, being surrounded by all these masked ninja was terrifying. I already gave my answer to the last group of Konoha ninja. Naruto addressed the falcon masked root. Even if you try to attack me, my response remains the same. Leave now, or I'll make sure none of you do. The root anbu took a ready stance and prepared to strike. Unbeknownst to Naruto, their true goal is to divert his attention while Sai and a few others attempt to kidnap one of his other children. Along with Sai, Sai sensed that his comrades were about to confront Naruto directly. When Sai was assigned this task, he knew that facing off against Naruto, the infamous white fox, would be an interesting match. But when Danzo told him to simply retrieve one of the children as leverage, that idea vanished. Sai and a few others arrived at the house that Asuma had mentioned a few days before. One of the root, who was not wearing a mask, used a wood-style jutsu to quietly break the door hinges. They went inside once the door was open in search of a child. They were unconcerned about the wife and had no plans to deal with her. So, if and when they come across her, they'll almost certainly have to subdue or injure her in order to get Naruto's attention. Hey, a young voice came from the right of the group of four. They turned to see a young boy in orange shorts and a white shirt standing there with an angry expression on his face. Who are you, and what are you doing in our house? Boruto summoned them. Target obtained, Sai said as he ducked behind the boy to deliver a chop to the boy's neck. When he got close, a hand grabbed his wrist and squeezed it tightly, making a loud snap sound. Sai gritted his teeth, gasping in pain but suppressing other emotions. I have no idea who you are, and I don't care. A feminine voice spoke up, but it sent shivers down the root's spine. But you signed your own death warrants the moment you laid eyes on my son. She wore a long black gown with red trim on the ends and sleeves. Hirama's eyes burned with rage as she flung the pale root with incredible force at his comrades. Sai collided with the three, sending them flying out of the house. Okay, Kasan. Boruto yelled excitedly, raising his fist in the air. Hirama simply smiled and shook her head in response to her son's antics. Boruto must remain inside. I'm going to deal with these Kanoha jerks. Waruto excitedly nodded and shook his head as he witnessed the rare occurrence of seeing his mother in action. He caught glimpses of her and his father sparring, but never seriously enough to be called a fight. So for the young blonde, this would be very interesting to watch. Hirama stepped out and smirked at the four as they stood up to defend themselves. Despite only having one arm, Sai pulled out a scroll and a brush. He began writing in the scroll with his teeth, and a few ink animals rushed towards Kirama. She didn't even flinch because all she did was flare a tiny portion of her kai, causing the ink to melt from the heat. 
before were taken aback. But before they could say or do anything else, Kirama was already next to them in a blur of speed they couldn't even see. She shattered the rest of Sai's arm and smashed his already broken hand, sending him flying away from them. When he saw the woman reach for a short sword just beneath her dress, the man without a mask went wide-eyed and leapt back. The man without a mask looked through his brown hair as his two other comrades were brutally beheaded. Damn, he was about to say his jutsu as he went through a few hand seals and was about to say it when the woman turned to him with those burning red eyes. He froze as he saw his death unfold in brutal and inhumane ways in front of him. He froze as he was ensnared in this jinjutsu that was far too advanced for any ordinary person to perform. Who was this lady? Who exactly did Naruto Uzumaki marry? Kirama approached him slowly before he could think any further. She knew she could have ended this battle in a variety of ways, but she also knew that revealing too much would endanger her family. Instead of simply killing these Konoha scumbags with one of her own techniques, she chose Kenjutsu over her flashy methods of fighting her husband. Kirama approached the man, who was shaking violently at the time. She came to a halt directly in front of him, smirking down at his pitiful state before drawing her sword arm back to deliver the killing blow. That's when she felt something she hadn't felt in a long time, and it brought her to a halt. When she returned home, she was startled to see a long snake wrapped around her son's entire body. The snake hissed at her before disappearing with an unconscious Boruto in tow. B-O-R-U-T-O. Hirama yelled as she flared her kai to titanic proportions. Naruto is involved. At this point, Naruto had just finished the rest of the rude Anbu. It was difficult at first because he had to protect his daughter while also lacking a weapon. Apart from Cage Bushin, he couldn't use any of his major jutsu for fear of inadvertently hurting Akira. He needed some time, but he was able to deal with them quickly. Just as he finished the last of the route, he and his daughter heard the loudest shout, sending shockwaves through the valley. The Kai caused all of the clones to poof and nearly knocked Akira out. Naruto grabbed her and activated his own Kai to keep her safe. If Kirama is doing this, something bad must have happened to Boruto. Naruto grabbed Akira and dashed over to the house, only to find her clutching a pale root member by the throat and yelling angrily at him. What did you do with my son? She continued to yell, unknowingly killing the man with her very presence. Where has he gone? Naruto had seen her this angry before, so it wasn't surprising, but Akira was terrified right now. She had never seen her mother in such a state before. The sight of her rage as tails began to emerge from her lower back caused the little girl to cower behind her father. Naruto noticed this and went to his enraged wife to console her. Where has he gone? Kirama. Naruto put a hand on her shoulder, causing her to turn around, her eyes red with rage. That's all. Not until I know where these worthless sacks of flesh have taken our boy. She yelled at him, her tails twirling in rage. And do you really want to show your daughter this side of you? Naruto said softly to her as he moved toward his wife, seeing Akira shake with fear. Kirama's eyes widened as she noticed the fear in Akira's eyes. Everything was aimed at her. She let go of the nearly lifeless body and repressed her rage. Her tails retracted within her body, and her kai vanished. Her rage had been replaced by grief and sadness in her own eyes. She wanted to speak to her own flesh and chakra, but no words came to her as she broke down. Naruto clung to her because he knew this was a side of her that she never wanted her children to see. Akira slowly approached her parents and was about to say something when another presence appeared and knocked her out with a chop to the back of her head. Naruto and Kirama turned around to find Sasuke Uchiha standing there with their daughter, much to their surprise and rage. Before summoning his sharing and eyes, he smirked at them. Before the two could turn away, they were caught in a Jinjutsu designed for the Kyuubai itself. Sasuke had created a special Jinjutsu to incapacitate the beast within Naruto. Naruto struggled to get to his feet as the woman fell to the ground, slightly seizing up. He was going to save his children no matter what the cost was to himself. That's S. Sasuke. Naruto yelled as he attempted to stand again. What exactly are you doing here? He struggled to say anything. Hum. As he held Akira up, Sasuke smirked at his former rival. Why don't you come and get your children if you want them to be safe? He lowered Akira and began walking away. Before he did, he returned the same smirk to Naruto. Oh, and ask their leader if you really want to know where I am with these two brats of yours. He pointed to the man who was still trapped in the Jinjutsu, and the pale root member who was gasping for air before vanishing in a shunshin. Naruto's eyes widened as he finally broke the Jinjutsu. He then went over to Kirama, who was still seizing from the powerful sharing in Jinjutsu, and freed her. She had stopped seizing and was now unconscious. Despite her status as the world's most powerful demon, Jinjutsu powerful enough to confuse her fox form can incapacitate her in her human form. 
Naruto let her sleep as he heard the root with no mask grown from the Jinjutsu he had released on himself. Naruto's eyes narrowed in rage as he turned around to see the man attempt to stand. Naruto approached the man, who was standing on wobbly legs. As he looked up at the irritated blonde, he attempted to use his wood-style jutsu, but was still affected by Kirama's Jinjutsu. Naruto snatched the man by the throat and lifted him off the ground. The man attempted to summon a jutsu again. But this time a Naruto clone cut both of his hands with Akai Akuma. As he began to bleed, the man shrieked in agony. Before poofing away, the clone handed Naruto his blade. Naruto's grip on the man tightened as he cast a piercing glare into his eyes. A terrifying glare that could make even the mightiest of men tremble. Who on earth sent you? If he didn't get an answer, Naruto threatened to kill himself. Because he could no longer defend himself with Jutsu, the man replied in a pained tone. Danzo-sama sent us to ensure your wartime loyalty. Naruto's eyes glowed even brighter with rage. He remembered Danzo as a child and how much the man would discuss plans for him with his own Anbu. Naruto realized a little after his banishment that Danzo intended to use him as a kind of weapon for Konoha. He was able to escape those rude Anbu back then thanks to Kirama. If Danzo knew where Orochimaru was, it was time for Naruto to find out for himself. If he wanted my attention, Naruto began, Lowering his head, he's got it. Naruto raised his head. Danzo will provide me with the information I require. Then I'll go look for Orochimaru and Sasuke. And when I'm done skinning the flesh from their bones and allowing maggots to feast on their carcasses while they're still alive, I'm going to burn Konoha to the ground. Naruto flicked his wrist and snapped his neck in half with ease before the man could protest. He let go of the man and continued to rage until he heard muffled groans behind him. He turned to see Kirama slowly stir herself awake, as well as the last root Anbu groaning in the distance. Naruto approached his wife and slowly lifted her up. Naruto, Kirama spoke slowly, her eyes showing her distress. Kirama, Naruto began softly before looking at her sternly. As he said his next words to her, he had a determined look in his eyes. We're headed to Konoha. So this was it for today, I will continue the story next part, till then we weave offline.